when I um, decided I was going to melt down the six hour MCX rifle, I mean, I, I was living in New York at the time and I started calling foundries and they were like, lady, you are crazy. You think that we are going to let you take an assault rifle and put it in our like, you know, industry level foundry kiln, like no way in hell. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Stephanie Mercedes is on the show. If you like hearing from creatives who work in a unique artistic space, this interview is for you. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that no artist in the country perhaps even the world, is doing what Mercedes is doing right now out of her studio in Washington, D.C. Mercedes is an Argentine-American, multidimensional artist who melts guns, bullets, and shell casings into bells, harp strings, and other works of art. Mercedes is fascinated by the concept of taking objects that were built so that they cannot easily be destroyed, objects that are built for violence, and melting them down, transforming them into things of beauty, grace, and instruments of change. Although Mercedes went to art school, attended Smith College, and did art residencies throughout Latin America, much of what she does as an artist today is actually self-taught. Some of it she even learned from YouTube of all places. Her calling into this form of art started with the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting. As a gay Latina, the gravity of this horrific act of violence against the LGBTQ community inspired her to make a profound statement with her art by taking objects of violence and turning them into a sonic expression of joy. After the Pulse shooting, she melted the same make and model gun used in the shooting into 49 Liberty Bells, one for each of the victims of the shooting. This is what launched her career as an artist, allowing her to expand her reach into installations that incorporate movement, dance, music, and history. What's so cool about artists like Mercedes although one could argue that there are no other artists like Mercedes, is that she's focused on the intersection of art with politics, life, history, and morality. If you can, I highly recommend going to her website, which is stephaniemercedes.com. The link is in my show notes. And checking out her work before you listen to the episode so you can get a visual of her work as you listen to our conversation. So let's jump right into my talk with Washington, D.C.-based artist, Stephanie Mercedes. Stephanie Mercedes, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. Well, um, I read a little bit about you online, and I saw somewhere that you prefer to be called, or that most people call you Mercedes. Is that what you would like to be called? Yeah. You know, I um, I love my first name, Stephanie, but I just feel like there's something about um, Mercedes, which fits me a little bit better. So okay. I like, as confusing as it is for everyone, I prefer to go by Mercedes. All right, Mercedes. I'll, I'll call you that throughout the interview. Why don't well, we start off by you telling the listeners, if um, you're on a train and the person sitting next to you, a complete stranger asks you, what do you do? What is your profession? How would you answer that question? I mean, what, what I would tell um, the stranger on the train is probably that um, I'm an artist, but uh, which can mean so many things, which is the beauty of being an artist. Um, but what I do is I take weapons and I melt them down and I turn them into musical installations, works of art, and musical instruments. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really the core of what I do. Um, and uh, that can be... Uh, Anything from choreographing a large-scale performance to commissioning a small piece. Um, but the really core of um, my goal and my practice as an artist is to try to take, you know, these objects of violence and these objects which have caused harm, like bullet casings, uh, rifles, pistols, handguns, and to really try to melt them down and transform them into what I believe is their opposite, which is mm. objects of care and peace. Hmm. Yeah, taking those core elements that at their core, they are harmless, but they've been turned into something that is harmful and has been used for acts of hate. Uh, and you're, you're sort yeah. of retransforming it, taking it back to back to its roots, but also putting it in a form that is something that people can kind of unify around as an object of, of peace 
Is yeah, that, totally. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's completely true. You know, I mean, um, I I think for me one of the beauties of of metal is that um, you know you can take any piece of metal if it's iron in whatever shape it is, and if you have the ability to get something hot enough, you can melt it down and turn it into liquid, and completely retransform it into any into anything you want. And mm. um, I think that's what's always attracted me to the medium. Um, that something so hard can become soft so quickly, um, and you can really remold that thing. And I feel like that's that's so powerful. And to be able to take these objects, which were you know really built so that they could not be destroyed. A lot of times, guns have multiple melting points. They're made out of a combination of so many different alloys um, and metals that they're they're not meant to be melted down. Um, but I feel like there's such beauty in a complete act of transformation. And I feel like, you know, as an artist, that is, that's my end goal to try to completely transform something um, from one thing into, into another. Yeah. So tell us about your journey, getting to the point where you are doing something very specific in an artistic mm -hmm. space, because I, I don't think that anyone else in the country is doing what you're doing. I mean, that would be my guess. If I were to do a Google search for an <laughs> artist uh, who is doing what you're doing, it would be very difficult to find somebody yeah. in that niche. So how did you find that niche? And um, what were your influences culturally, politically, or otherwise that kind of uh, guided you there? Well, you know, I think in a lot of ways, um, it really began with the fact that my... Um, my whole father's side of the family, who are Argentinian, they're all uh, motorcycle mechanics. And they all um, really build these hyper-custom um, bikes, which um, are, are so custom-made that a lot of times the parts which are created have to be made out of scrap metal. They have to be, you know, random things which are taken off the street and then welded or melted down and, and returned into something else. Mm. So I think, I think in, you know... Um, even though I went to art school and studied something else completely differently, I think this idea of working with metal and of, of taking recycled metal and transforming it into something else was kind of always part of my psyche and part of my blood. Uh, you know, I, I probably changed like the transmission on the car for the first time when I was like under five years old. So I oh think... Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's, that's my, crazy. My, I know. <laughs> my mother wasn't so happy about that. But, um, you know, my father used to, like, uh, put us on his chest and go under a car and work on it. So I think this idea of working with metal was just, you know, always, always part of my unconscious. And um, I went to art school. I went to Smith College. I, uh, I took some time off in the middle and did artist residencies throughout Latin America and um, I think during that period of time, I was really thinking about what is my framework and what is my context as an artist and, you know, what, what do I want to be thinking about? What do I want to be reacting to? Um, so that was an important period of time for me. But um, it wasn't until I graduated college that um, I realized I wanted to start melting down guns. And mm. for me, that really began with the Orlando Pulse Club shooting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gay. I'm Latina, and I had always felt very unsafe in Latin America and very naively safe in the United States. And I really felt like Orlando was a big wake-up call, you know? I mean, how many times have I danced to reggaeton in the gay club? Like, I can't even count, you know, over the thousands. And how many times have I felt completely safe um, and completely at home in, in a gay Latinx nightclub? Again, so many times. So I really felt like um, it was this moment in my artwork where I knew that I had to respond to the tragedy which had occurred, but there were so many things. I felt like on one level, how could I even respond to such a horrific and unimaginable act of violence? How could I make artwork and respond to that? How could I create something which was both healing and transformational and also in some ways brought justice to those people who had lost their lives. Um, and so I really, uh, when thinking about what, how did I wanted to react to um, this event, I decided to take a, to buy a six hour M6 rifle, which is the exact model of rifle that was used by the shooter 
and um, and to melt it down and turn it into 49 Liberty Bells for the 49 individuals who lost their lost their lives that night. And, uh, you know, that was really the, the beginning of a huge um, body of work for me. And I decided that I wanted to work, I wanted to make Liberty Bells because in Latin American culture, when someone dies, you, you ring a bell in order to resurrect the dead and pay homage to their souls. And I think there was something really appealing about this idea of taking objects of violence and objects which had caused hate and trying to force them into a bell, right? A bell can also be a form of celebration. It can be uh, a way of um, a sort of sonic assimilation with joy, um, but also with memory and with happiness and with mourning. Mm. Uh, And so all of those things, I really felt like there was a beauty to casting these bells out of bullets, out of guns, And at the same time, uh, I was having a conversation with my mother um, after the shooting happened. And uh, she said, you know, I think you might want to cast Liberty Bells um, because a Liberty Bell, it's not only the symbol of the United States, the symbol why people immigrate here, you know, this idea of freedom, but it's also the symbol used by the NRA. Mm. Um, And, you know, in Spanish, there's a phrase, doble filo, uh, a double-edged sword, and I really felt like that was the double-edged sword of gun control in this country. Um, the fact that the one thing which, you know, all of our families want to immigrate to this country for because of the idea of freedom was the same symbol and the same idea that was allowing all of these people um, to um, use it in order to support Second Amendment rights. Uh, so, you know, the Liberty Bell just really stuck with me. and. Um, and that's how I cast, that's how I began making this type of work. And that's how I began casting bells out of guns and, and mm. bullets. It's profound. Yeah. And there's so many different interpretations, too, of the, the bell. And I'm glad you brought mm. up the NRA connection, um, because I think that makes it a little more provocative, too. And I think mm-hmm. that's important for art to be provocative sometimes, not always, but... Mm-hmm. Um, to to have a, a sort of a counter narrative to mm-hmm. push against the uh, the narrative that we've heard for decades from the NRA about what liberty means, and mm-hmm. if uh, for instance you're and I and I come from a town Yakima, you may be familiar with with Yakima, yes, <laughs> uh, but uh, I come from a town which is very politically aligned with the the NRA typically. A lot of gun racks, a lot of, you know, flag waving, uh, truck driving, uh, patriot type of people at, at here. And, and I, I'm not saying that um, flippantly or, or disrespectfully. It's just the way it is here. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are, are pro gun. Um, but I think sometimes symbols get co opted by movements. And, and this might be a way to take that symbol back and also in a provocative way, make people think, think what is Liberty? When you say, yeah. well, you, you uh, put a limitation on purchases of guns, whether it's a criminal background check or whatever the limitation is. And they say, well, that's taking away my freedom yet. Here you are uh, a gay Latina woman who thought it was safe in America, or at least safer in America than it was in South America. Um, but you no longer feel safe. Mm-hmm. And that's not freedom either. I mean, that's right. the definition of uh, of tyranny, where you don't feel safe in your own home. You don't feel safe in a, in a cafe or a club. And so I think we need to really start redefining or at least opening up that dialogue of what freedom means. And those Liberty Bells really, I mean, I've looked at a lot of your work and those bells, I think, accomplish that. So, yeah, yeah. I, I also think that um, it's very interesting because I've had a lot of exchanges with people who have very different um, views on gun control than I do through my work. Um, and sometimes just randomly, people that are walking, passing through my studio, um, of course, in a pre-COVID world. And 
And I, I think in some ways it's interesting because my work tends to be, um, it's very soft, you know, it's very soft and gentle and not aggressive. And it's kind of this alternative um, form of protest. And and I think because of that, it because of the softness of the pieces, it allows for a sort of different conversation to um, to begin and to emerge. You know, I've had people who... Uh, experience my work and they love it and then they learn the secret behind the piece that the piece is made out of it or they walk closer to the bells and they read the names of the victims on the bells and that they're cast out of out of a rifle out of an assault weapon and um, and sometimes they're members of the NRA sometimes they have very different views on gun control than I do but I think that because we're entering the conversation through this language of art they're thinking about it emotionally rather than intellectually. And it it creates a very different space. And I'm actually, I'm so interested in what that means. Mm. And um, I, um, I actually just wrote a grant with one of my friends who runs an organization called Issue Voter. And Issue Voter is this amazing platform that allows people to um, be informed about bills and reach out directly to their representatives if they uh, support or don't support a bill. It's amazing because it's apparently one of the most effective ways for any individual in the United States to directly make sure that their voice is heard and to directly impact change. And so what we're going to do is we're basically going to facilitate these conversations um, using art as a medium uh, with people who have opposing views. And the first one is going to be about um, pending gun control legislation. And it's going to be, you know, with a variety of people, maybe with someone who might be in your hometown and then maybe, uh, you know, who has different different views on gun control. And then also maybe someone who, um, someone who lives in D.C. and has believes that, you know, all all guns should be abolished, and I think it's it's really important to have these conversations right now, especially because we live in such a, a bipartisan world. And I think that um, art can really be the sort of language and space of mediation for those conversations to be had. And I, you know, I, I'm always surprised by how open people are to my work. Um, I just cast a, a harp out of um, bullets. I learned how to make harp strings out of bullet casings. And I had to interview this woman who's a professional harpist. And um, it turns out that her family are members of the NRA. And and I didn't learn that until after I made the piece. And I said, well, why do you want to work with me? You know, you know, you know what my intentions are, even if, you know, they're not so intense. But, and she said, well, you know, at the end of the day, I think that your work is about humanity. And how could I, how could I, think it's okay for any person to die unnecessarily. Mm. Um, and, and I really love that, you know? Yeah. And I also feel like, you know, coming from someone who I have spent, I mean, it's kind of funny. My day job is literally like taking apart rifles, you know? Um, and I have spent so much time taking these rifles apart. I, I think there's a really big difference between a hunting rifle that has an RPM of, let's say, like one a minute. And it's this antique hunting rifle, which is engraved and handmade and super, super slow in contrast to an AK-47 with a bump stock. You know, there's, it's a big difference right there. Yeah. Um, so what, what I also say to people who have, who, you know, do believe in the Liberty Bell as um, a form of Second Amendment rights and they don't want those Second Amendment rights to be taken away of is, I think it's fine if people want to have that hunting rifle with a slow RPM. But do you need to have a really fast Glock with the bump stock? Do you need to have an AK-47 with the bump stock? That's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I, I do hope that, um, that artwork and my artwork in general will create spaces for those, for those conversations because, you know, we really need to have them right now, especially in this country. Yeah, I, I think the, the way I would describe what art does like yours not, not only does it create a space, but it, it's almost a portal, like mm. a safe place portal to reach people, as you say, emotionally, as opposed to intellectually. It's easy to get those two confused too, because I think a lot of what we see on Facebook, when people post a meme on whatever side they're on, it's, it comes from a very emotional place. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, yeah. It comes from a place of anger. But if the emotion, if you're listening to bells or you're looking at these bells hanging from an, an installation 
and you realize how much work went into what you did and also the place within you that this came from. Mm -hmm. It did not come from a place of hate. Uh, you're not holding a picket sign or saying, you know, fuck the NRA or whatever. Your, your message is a very soft message. And that's the great thing about art like yours is you're coming at something from a completely different angle. And I think it can catch people by surprise. They can be caught off guard like, wait a minute, I'm actually connecting with this. Yeah, yeah. But, and and I'm, I don't know why I am because I'm a big Second Amendment person, but I'm really connecting with it. And that's what's so special about your project. Yeah. And I, I think, um, and, you know, again, it's, I can't, I can't tell you the number of times people, sometimes fellow artists, where they are like, well, I have different, very different views on gun control, but I also love your work. Um, and I think that that speaks, that speaks to sometimes I think that um, people mistaken issues of humanity with politics. Mm. Um, and I do believe it's important to, you know, you can influence politics as an artist, but sometimes I think people get confused, you know, at the end of the day, if it's about um, people, you know, the value of their lives and if they can remain to be alive, you know, that's a question of humanity. And I, and I think that um, at the end of the day, that's what I want my work to be about. The, um, your work on the Orlando um, project, you know, the Pulse nightclub the, uh, shooting that inspired you to do that first piece of gun melting work that you've done. Um, have you had any conversations with survivors of that shooting and seen their reaction to it or family members um, who may have seen your work? Yeah. So I was actually, um, I have a, I have, so part of my practice too is I'm, I'm very into uh, performance and specifically participatory performance, which just means that a lot of times I make these, you know, large scale installations made out of melted bullets or guns. And then I like to choreograph uh, musical performances around them, which sometimes involve choirs and dance. And I like to sort of involve the audience as much as possible. And the reason why I do that is because I feel like, you know, my work is about people who have died. And I, and I hope that my practice can always return back to the live body. And in this case, um, with Pulse, I, I, I always want this, this particular piece to always return back to the live queer body, right? And, um, and so uh, after I made um, The Ring of Freedom, which is the 49 Liberty Bells um, cast out of the Sig Sauer M6 rifle, I decided to also choreograph a performance, which is called The Last Song. And it's called The Last Song because, uh, you know, the shooting happened in the middle of a nightclub, which means that um, these people were dancing. And in the middle of dancing, in the middle of celebrating, in the middle of listening to music, um, that's when they took their last breaths. And so in this performance, I'm essentially finishing the last song, which should have but could not finish. I saw that, by the way. Very, oh, I'm so glad. Very moving, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I've I've re-performed it a, a couple of times, and, you know, each time a little bit differently. And uh, I um, was invited to re-perform it at a anti-gun violence um, concert here in D.C. at the National United Methodist Church in um, last fall. And it was it was really special because they had the piece suspended from, you know, I don't even know how tall it was. It was an enormous uh, vaulted ceiling. And then we did the performance with a hundred person choir. And uh, I got really lucky because one of my friends was doing a residency in Baltimore, very close to DC. And she called me and she was like, Mercedes, I have someone you have to meet. You have to meet this person. And um, so I invited the person out to come see the piece. And it turns out that this individual um, had survived the Pulse Club shooting. Oh my goodness! And um, and it was it was just kind of this amazing moment because she is also a um, she's also a photographer. She's a very talented photographer. She also has a beautiful voice. But you know, at the end of the day, all of these pieces that I have been making are really for her. You know, it's about feeling like there's this small ounce of justice in the world. But she also said something which was, you know so intense for me is that um, she was like, I so easily could have been one of those bells, which is hanging um, in front of her. 
And uh, so I'm, I'm really glad that I got to see, you know, that I got to meet her and that she got to experience the work and that it meant so much to her. And then the other thing that I also learned from her is that in Pulse, there were actually multiple dance floors happening all at the same time, which means that there were multiple last songs. So um, the, the performance which I have done so far is um, to a Shakira song, which is one of the songs that was playing. But it turns out that there was also um, a song by Drake that was playing. And, uh, and so I hope at some point to also, again, do another iteration of this last song performance, but to do it with this individual who survived Orlando, because she also happens to have a beautiful voice. Um, and it's really crazy because in the song, some of the lyrics of the Drake song are, I pray to make it back in one piece. I pray, I pray. Uh, which is, that's just crazy. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think, I always think as an artist that your practice sometimes um, knows more about what you're doing than you do. And the best thing to do is just try to follow your practice. And I feel like meeting her was just a continuation of my practice, really knowing what's going on. Um, and I also hope um, at some point in the fall, I want to make her a camera cast out of melted bullets, which will be fully functional. So, you know, the the world just has a way of making sure you meet the right people and and that and that everything comes full circle. Wow, you're going to make a camera, a fully yeah. functioning camera. <laughs> That's <laughs> that is pretty ambitious. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think that um I'm always like this, but I think a big part of my work is conceptually deciding, okay, what do I want to do? And sometimes it's the craziest idea in the whole world. And then mm -hmm. afterwards I have to sit down and I have to think, okay, how can I actually do this? And all of my pieces have been like this, you know, when I um, decided I was going to melt down the six hour MCX rifle. I mean, I, I was living in New York at the time and I started calling foundries and they were like, lady, you are crazy. You think that we are going to let you take an assault rifle and put it in our like, you know, industry level foundry kiln like no way in hell. So, um, but it took me, it took me a year to make that piece, but I eventually figured it out. Um, Did you have to make your own kiln? Yeah, I, um, so all of the pieces since then, I've made my own kiln, but for that one piece, it was such a big rifle that I ended up getting really lucky. There was um, the New York Art Foundry, which has since uh, shut down. I was able to convince her to let me um, melt the rifle there. Um, and then we got a, a jeweler to make all of the molds. And so that was, there was like this combination of trying to convince her to do it and also trying to teach myself at the same time. Um, and so after, after that pace, now I make everything myself, but it was, you know, it was really intense. And part of the intensity was the fact that she kept on freaking out. She thought it was going to blow up. Um, <laughs> what, even yeah. if you show that it's, it's, uh, you know, there's no bullets in the chamber and all well, that? Well, part of the issue of, like, when you're melting down metal on a big scale, it's, of course, you know, um, you know it's not even an issue of gunpowder. Uh, gunpowder is very bad, obviously. I right. mean, I, um, I clean all of the bullets, especially you have to dry them. But, you know, if there's... But uh, melting metal is a very... It's a very fickle mm. art, and it's a very fickle chemistry. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And part of the issue is that you just don't want to have... Uh, one alloy which has a little bit of a higher melting point than another alloy and you know again uh, a gun is very often like a mutt dog like you have no idea what's in it but we we got lucky a six hour m6 rifle is um surprisingly is one of the few guns of its size in the world that's made mostly out of aluminum mm. and that's because it is the civilian equivalent to an ak-47 and if you are in the military you're you know, you're working out every day, you're super strong, and you have the, the capability to hold something which is really heavy. And a six-hour MCX rifle is made for people who are not in the military. They're civilians, and so it's supposed to be lighter and easier to use, which is, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, you know, I, um, the, a lot of times I just think of something totally insane, and then I have to figure out how to do it. But, you know, the, the beauty of art and the beauty of metalsmithing and of blacksmithing is that you know pretty almost almost anything is possible, um, which is which is amazing. So, fingers crossed, I will be making a camera out of melted bullets, nice. and uh, and hopefully it'll be fully functional. Fil film camera or DSLR? <laughs> uh, I think we're going to go for a film. 
I yeah. don't think I'm ready for a DSLR. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be like a lifetime project. Um, right. But uh, yeah, but I think a film would be really cool. So you told us about your experience uh, changing transmissions and you know dismantling transmissions at age five. So you you obviously mm-hmm. have this technical knowledge that probably translates really well into uh, metal smithing. What else did you have to do in terms of education and classes and reading to really get up to speed to do what you do now? Well, to be honest, it's it's really difficult because metalsmithing and blacksmithing are the really dying. It's a dying art form, you know. It's something that is, you know. I was in, I was an artist in residence recently at Montgomery College, and I could not believe they have a jewelry studio, and it's really one of the few um, universities in the area that has that has a small foundry set up. And oh my God, I was just like drooling over all of the equipment they had. It was beautiful, you know, and I I had nothing like that when I was a student. Um, so it, it is a little bit sad. It's a, it's a dying art form. Um, not a lot of people are studying it anymore. Not a lot of people are learning how to do it. And then, you know, and then on top of that, if you're trying to force metal to make sound, that's even harder, you know? Mm. I mean, casting is one thing, but then trying to force it to, to, you know, trying to take this material, trying to cast it, and then to force it to make a beautiful sound is like a whole new level of difficulty. Um, but, you know, one, one that I, I enjoy the challenge. And I think that, to be honest, um, a lot of, I'm super, I'm super self-taught, and a lot of the things which I learned, I have learned off of YouTube. Wow. Um, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Which is really funny, but you know, there's a lot of uh, it, there's a lot of like back home people making their own, you know, kilns, um, YouTube videos, and uh, I do a lot of sand molds, which are you know, it's a it's a beautiful medium because the object tends to be super organic, and um, and it's really cheap. It's easy to do. You add oil, you can remix it. Um, but a lot of what I've learned has been off of YouTube, which is mm. really strange and funny, but, um, <laughs> but it's worked, you know, so far it's worked. And, uh, and I've also gotten really lucky. I mean, uh, normally what I do is I have to, let's say I want to make, for instance, like harp strings out of melted bullets. What I have to do is I have to reach out to a professional harpist and then I have to find someone who knows how to make harp strings. Aren't those usually nylon or or gut or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so they're normally they're normally cat gut like um, violin strings, but the Celtic harp is actually cast out of brass. Oh, uh, okay, yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> now I know way too much about harps, but um, <laughs> I interviewed a harpist, by the way. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah, Chris Kincaid. If you want to go back and listen to it, it's a good interview. So. Oh, I, I should, I should, li- I should listen to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a lot of times I just, I have to figure out how to do it myself and um, I am super excited. I'm going to be a graduate fellow at the University of Maryland starting in September. And um, what I'm going to be learning there is basically how to do everything which I do now, but on a much bigger scale. So instead of casting, let's say like a gong, which weighs like 50 pounds, like how can I cast a gong, which weighs a thousand pounds, you know? Um, how can I work on a much, much bigger scale? Mm. Have a team of people helping you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that's what I see in the glass, in the glass blowing world, because I've interviewed, uh, a glass blower and a neon artist as well. Mm. Um, mm. Dan Friday is a glass blower from the Lumi tribe. Uh, but uh, what I've noticed about glass blowing is it's a, cause you're working with high temperatures, probably very similar to metal smithing your high temperatures. Mm. There's you know, limited window of time to do certain things that are really important to get what you want out of this material. Um, so it requires a team of people. And I, I would imagine that, you know, having that, being a fellow and having other students who want to learn and kind of help you do this would be immensely uh, beneficial. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it will be um, beneficial. There there gets to a point, like right now I have a... Um, you know, so your crucible is what you put the metal in, and it's basically made out of graphite. It's made out of the same thing that the tip of your pencil is made out of. So that starts out black, and then it will it will go up to about 2,000 degrees. And then that's what you use to pour into your mold, which you've made beforehand. And um, so I have different sized, um, different sized crucibles and kilns, but right now 
um, my my when I'm casting really big things, I have my girlfriend help me because it's too heavy for one person to carry. So we cast big stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I I think that the the beauty of metal is that uh, a lot of times the equipment is not very expensive, um, and the mold making, if you're not working in lost wax, is also can be very cheap. But it's all about learning how to do this stuff. And the other thing is that it's you know it's dangerous. It's really mm. dangerous. I mean, I wear I wear a leather apron. I wear something the same thing that like firefighters wear over their hair, um, and a face shield. Um, and like, gracias a Dios, nothing has happened so far. But you know, you always want to be protected in case something goes wrong. And like, there's um, YouTube videos of guys doing pours, and then they sweat, and the sweat goes down their leather apron, goes into the crucible, and the whole thing explodes. You wow. know. Oh, and like, geez. and imagine, you know, if, you know, and this, so when you start working on a bigger scale, everything just becomes more dangerous, uh, which is not a bad thing. It's, you know, it adds to the beauty of the work, um, but you definitely have to be a little more careful. So yeah. <laughs> can you tell our listeners, how do you make a living doing what you do? Because I, I would imagine that you're, you're, you're probably self-employed. So you're, mm -hmm. you're on your own. And it's a hustle uh, to figure out a way to get paid fairly for your work. Um, you're, it sounds like you're, you have fellowships that you've landed with various schools over the years and you have one coming up. Does that mean in a fellowship that, that – I really don't know what a fellowship is, but does that mean that a school is, has certain um, funds that are available for artists to – yeah. Help teach their students for a year and also get the benefit of of the, yeah, the yeah. studio and that type of thing. Yeah. So I would say, um, so uh, you know, a big part of being an artist, um, especially I would say more experimental artists, is residencies and grants and fellowships. So the one that I'm gonna have at the University of Maryland, it's a three year fellowship. I'll be there. I will do some assistant teaching. Um, and, uh, but basically they'll, they'll pay me to make my work and to help a little bit around. Um, but I think that's a big part of being a professional artist is, uh, I moved to DC because I was, um, invited to be an artist in residence at Halcyon Arts Lab, which is an amazing space here. They give you, uh, an apartment and a studio and a stipend and you just basically make your work for a year, you know? And then when, once you make the work, are you allowed to sell it and profit from that work or do you have yeah, to? Yeah. Sure. yeah. No, so. no, no. Yeah. You can, okay. you can sell it. Um, and so I, you know, I would say that um, when you graduate from school, one of, you, one of the big issues of art school is that, um, you know, they're, they're not going to teach you any of this. There's very little of the business side of things or the mm. actual practical things, which is not so helpful. Same thing but, in law school. Same yeah. <laughs> thing in law school. They don't teach you anything about practicing law. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Actually, you know, I did an art and law program. Oh, really? In, yeah, yeah, in New York. So, so because my mother was a lawyer, I um I was always super interested in this idea of like artists manipulating legal structures, um as a student, and uh and so I wrote some contracts as works of art. And when I when I graduated from university, I um, moved to New York, and there's a program there in Brooklyn called the Art and Law Program, which is like a, a year-long program. And so I went through that, um, which I really loved. I actually have this other body. So part of my work is melting down guns and, and bullet casings. And the other part of my work is, um, is really responding to Argentinian history and trying to think about the history of the disappeared during the Argentine dictatorship and how can that history be kept alive and um, remain vibrant uh, despite a lot of times it's denial. And so I have this big project, which I feel like is just going to be ongoing for a long period of time. And it's in response to pending copyright legislation, which if passed would basically um, make a lot of the images which document this horrific period of time where 30,000 people disappeared because of the military regime. Um, it would make all of those images which are currently in the public domain become privatized. Yeah, uh, I, I saw that online. Uh, what another ambitious project? I mean, yeah. how you're you're changing. I mean, you talk about art and law, yeah. and how that. I'm sure that your art and law experience helped you with that vision. Because, well, why don't you just tell listeners what you did with those images to try to preserve them while also not 
violating copyright Mm -hmm. and being able to preserve them for future generations. Right. So um, uh, in the United States, uh, copyright is 70 years post-production, which means, um, or or post-mortem, which means like after the artist or the photographer dies. And currently in Argentina, it's 30 years post-production, which is after I make a work of art or after you take an image or whatever the case might be. And um, and so the pending legislation would change it from post-production to post-mortem, which should be a good thing for individual photographers and artists because it basically means they have the right to their work for a longer period of time. However, in the case of the Argentine dictatorship, um, it's very particular because a lot of the people who documented this you know, horrific and brutal and mostly covered up violent history in Argentina were photographers who themselves disappeared. And one of the horrible loopholes in Argentina is that if you disappeared, you do not have a death date and you do not have the legal rights to death. So if all of these images, if if the legislation is passed and all of these images um, will essentially become retroactively privatized by the state and they'll be inaccessible to to the public at large. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking um, I'm taking these images, which are which have been uh, photographed by uh, photographers who themselves disappeared, and I'm altering them in four ways. Um, so I'm cropping them, I'm layering them, I'm reverting them back into a negative, um, and I'm changing a little, some, a little bit of the contrast of the images so that I personally can um, copyright the images and then donate them back into the public domain, which sounds super complicated, but essentially what I'm trying to do is just create this uh, is is to kind of sort of sidestep and both use the law at the same time and create this uh, archive of images which will permanently and forever be accessible to the Argentinian public. That's amazing. That, you know, I mean, it, yeah. To going back to your original statement, I think of something that's insane and I just figure out how to do it. <laughs> I mean, look what you've done. I mean, that's, that is so crazy ambitious and so cool because what's happening is a cover-up. Yeah. of of history and, and yeah. a horrific chapter of history uh i i didn't know a lot i mean i i learned about los um those uh des aparecidos i think they were referred to by my spanish teacher uh senior chama in in college mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i remember him telling us the story of that horrific chapter i think it was like 76 to 83 or something yep. where the yeah. junta came yeah. in and um and he was crying telling the story because I think he was Argentinian and um that was it though I, there wasn't I mean in American history books you don't see a lot about that chapter and perhaps it's because it's a different country it's far away but that is very recent history yeah and I mean and if you look what's happening in terms of the the strongman governments that are happening in Brazil and in America even. Um, we need this type of history and we need those pictures like you're trying to preserve. So thank you for yeah. doing that. Well, and, and um, you know, I always say that uh, it's really something which should be taught in American history because the United States was very largely responsible for allowing the disappearances to happen. The U.S. government propped up the Argentinian and the Chilean dictators at the same time. There's clear evidence, which I've included in my archive, that they sent a huge amount of funds um, to buy military supplies for the dictatorship, and um, and they also they were also like sat right next to the dictator during the World Cup in 1978 in Buenos Aires, which was the the height of los desaparecidos. Mm-hmm. So you know it's. Um, it's a it's a very it's a dark period of time and also uh you know the very issue of a disappearance and you know sometimes i think of these two bodies of work of mine as totally separate but at the, at the at the end of the day i think they're both trying to think about rituals of mourning and how there's so much um justice associated with having the right to mourn and having the right to mourn and to reconcile um and to find justice through artwork and um, with with this with this archive, I mean, imagine if you have a loved one and that loved one disappeared. You never have a body. You never have a body to mourn. Argentina is a very Christian, very Catholic country, and Catholicism, you know, it's all about the body. You bury the body, and so I think that's there's so much tragedy to that. And 
And, you know, and if the bodies of the disappeared are effaced, then how are people, how are students, how are historians, how are, you know, regular individuals who learn later on in life that they, that someone in their family disappeared, how are they supposed to, um, to understand and to acknowledge this history? And, you know, I remember the last time I was in Argentina, I was in the, um, the, the National Archives of Argentina. And it's very similar here in the United States. I have an aunt who works at the National Archives where, you know, they have a picture of the president and essentially the views of the National Archive and what is seen in the National Archive is a reflection of whoever is in power at the time. And I, you know, I was there and I had already been there before, but it, had, it was a different president at the time. And I'm talking to the researcher about what I'm looking for and she tells me in Spanish, she was like, well, she was like, if if you want to find more images about what supposedly happened during this period of time, you can go to this other archive. But here was like the head researcher of the National Archives of Argentina basically denying that this entire period of time and this entire history had happened, you know? That's so, it's so tragic. And I think that sometimes, um, I think sometimes artists and art really need to remind people both of the tragedies of the past and how they relate to the present, you know? Mm -hmm. If you, and I think that it, it connects to the gun melting down work because if I tell you 112 people die from gun violence in this country every day, maybe that means nothing to you. Maybe it's water which goes off your back. But if you see 112 bells cast out of bullets, Maybe, it, and you listen to them chime, and then you see them accumulate more and more. Maybe that's, you, you develop a different relationship to that number. It becomes mm -hmm. more, becomes more real. Um, and I think that, uh, that's, that's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Each of those bells is a voice that is being heard by who, mm -hmm. who is ever in the room. Uh, yeah. Or watching the the video online, um, it's uh, it's a very profound way to give a voice to the disappeared or to um, shooting victims. I think the disappeared have been represented through lockets. I've seen that in your work too. Yes, yes. So I have a body of work which is called Los Relicarios, and um, you know, I, and one of one of the most poetic things about this period of time in Argentina is that the first people to speak out against the regime were really uh, mothers and then later grandmothers who had lost their children and whose children had disappeared. And so they're now referred to as las madres de Playa de Mayo or las abuelas. And now we have, of course, hijos and hijas um, as time has passed on. And um, they were the first people to walk into the streets and to truly protest and protest during a time when, you know, protesting might mean that you disappear, um, which is so brave. And uh, and one of the things they used to do is they used to protest um, both wearing lockets of their loved ones and also holding lockets in their hands. Um, and I found that by... Uh, going through the personal archive of a, of a photographer who really focused on documenting them. And I really just, I loved that because in, in the same way that I think that my bells are, are kind of this alternative form of protest, I felt like they were taking this thing, which is uh, so soft and intimate, something which you normally wear close to you, your chest. It's normally very personal and intimate. You wear it under your clothes it's this emotional, raw, feminine thing, and they were taking that in order to speak truth to power. Um, and I love that. So the installation is a thousand lockets, and um, each one of them have their own individual light. So they basically act like little light boxes. And some of them don't have any faces because we don't have faces for everyone who disappeared. And some of them have faces of the disappeared. And part of the installation is song, and it's uh, and it's me re-singing the song of of the mothers and the abuelas. So it kind of comes through the the ceiling that the lockets are suspended from. This is a crazy question. Uh, yeah, it could be a total coincidence, but I was looking up the history of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, and um, th there is a name for one of the founders of that group, Maria Mercedes. 
And I was just wondering if there's any relation <laughs> to, to you. Oh, no, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not related to her. But Mercedes is a super common, it's a super common name in Latin America. And, Might be like Smith in, in, in America. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Smith. Yeah. Uh, so have you found that through your work, uh, when you go, because you have family in Argentina, right? Yeah. Um, when you go back or um, even when you're in America in D.C., do you ever hear about pushback from government officials or folks who are sympathetic to the Argentine government about uh, your work and whether you're getting you know, positive feedback, negative feedback, concern about how vocal you are, anything like that? I mean, I think that... Um... In some ways, it's kind of similar to these conversations with people who have different views on gun control. One of the things that always surprises me is that uh, no matter where I am in the world, I can be in the United States, I can be in Europe. If I'm somehow presenting the work or showing the work, or doing a performance, there is always somebody in the audience who either lost someone during the dictatorship, has a family member who is one of the disappeared, or um, you know knows someone else who is. And um, so I guess I feel like that there's something important about this aspect that a lot of times, no matter wherever I am in the world, there's someone who personally connects to the work. And, you know, I, I think that um, it's this interesting thing, right, where like I was just recently talking to one of my friends who works for a cultural organization here in D.C. And she was like, Mercedes, we have to get your work, you know, like we want to do a big public project outside. And I was, and she was like, but we can't do the gun melting stuff because it's too relevant to right now. So we should do the disappeared stuff, <laughs> uh, which is so funny because, you know, she's thinking, oh, it's history. It's like less political. And of course, it's not less political, you yeah. know. So it really depends on who you're talking to and what their understanding is of the history. Um, at the same time, like I had a meeting with a museum the last time I was in Argentina and they were like, we love your work. It's beautiful, but we have to wait like five years before we can show it until there's like a, a regime change. Um, wow. So, you know, and I, I think I'm always constantly surprised how people can deny that 30,000 people disappeared. That makes, um, you know, zero sense to me, but it's also part of the, um, Part of the violence of the era is that there are no clear numbers. There's no clear fact sheet, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, um, everything was burned. The few, the few images that we have from inside of the torture centers are literally because the photographers used to put them, used to risk their lives, put them inside of books and sew them inside of clothing for when they came back outside. And that's how we still have some of the original negatives. Mm -hmm. um, and. And I, I have another body of work, which is called um, Desplazamiento. And uh, it's this huge, basically, it's an installation. It's a site-specific installation. And what I do is I build in the gallery floor about a 60-foot-long pond with real water in it. And then I have um, a machine above the pond, which has negatives. And the negatives are slowly fluttering from the ceiling of the gallery into the pond. And that's because during the dictatorship, one of the ways that they used to get rid of bodies is they used to throw them into the ocean, into Rio de la Plata. And uh, so, um, and in Argentina, there's an area called Parque de la Memoria. So it's like the space that remembers the people who lost their lives. And the mythology is, is that there's so many people who uh, were dropped into Rio de la Plata that the sea level rose slightly during the era of the dictatorship. And so that's why this piece, which I have, um, is called Desplazamiento, because like the bodies which once fell, the negatives are slowly fluttering into this um, body of water and displacing the sea. Yeah, I saw that online too. And, and what an image, that that fissure in the, the floor that you have. Yeah. Or that, you know, it's a, it's a really profound image and also message too. And uh, if people are interested in that history, if you look up, uh, just Google Argentine dirty war, that's what the CIA refers to it as, the dirty mm -hmm. war. Lots of history on it. Probably don't want to get your history from the CIA uh, completely, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a starting point. <laughs> yeah. Then there's Wikipedia, and then there's probably a lot of good books on it too. But yeah, it's it's, it's also interesting. I mean, you talk about the, the unwillingness to um, accept 
that the disappeared, that it even occurred. And, and I think that that really lines up with what's happening right now in the world, the, mm-hmm. the willingness to disregard history, to disregard what's happening yeah. right, right before yeah. your eyes. Especially in the United States right now. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of the Completely. Orwellian, it's very Orwellian uh, yeah. to, to see it happening in real time. And, but then you go back and you realize that this is not new. Uh, this is a, yeah. a phenomenon that's just unfortunately been part of our humanity, our, our collective humanity for hundreds of years. Well, and I think that that's actually one of the reasons that art is so important. You know, like I, there is a, there is a artist who, um, I don't, I don't, I, he did it, he did it last year, but he basically recreated one of the largest slave rebellions that ever happened um, in New Orleans. And which, so, I mean, it was amazing. Like, talk about, like, an epic work of art. It was really, really enormous. And I think similarly, sometimes I have conversations with people in this country, and they're just like, no, the past was the past. What are you talking about reparations? Like, why is that important? And it's like, which is so difficult to have a conversation with. But then if you have these works of art, which allow for people to maybe have a better understanding, understand the true tragedy or to maybe open up the section of their brain, which is like closed off intellectually and to open it emotionally, hopefully they can understand a little bit more, you know, the history. And I think that, um, and because of course history constantly repeats itself and history is so relevant to the present and there's no way that we can deny history. Um, and the injustices of history will, will constantly follow us. Um, as a nation, as a people, and um, and I truly believe that art can be this kind of funny gray area where people can enter into it and um, experience history in a different way, and hopefully learn for the learn for the better. Thank you so much for your time. I just have a couple of um, follow up questions that are a little more practical, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're if you're giving advice to a room full of high school students who have mm-hmm. aspirations to create art in some way. Um, is art school something that you would recommend? You've been through art school, but it sounds like you're doing something different than what you learned in art school. So how important yeah. was it for you? And do you recommend it to other kids? So it's funny. Um, so I am just starting to start my own podcast called La Valentina And um, it's a queer Latinx podcast. And, uh, you know, it's just me and another one of my friends hanging out and talking about what does it mean to be an artist. And we talk exactly about this for an hour because art school is so difficult, you know. And I think that um, for me personally, I learned a lot more things from doing artist residencies at a young age, you know, starting probably at like age uh, 19 or 20 because I was surrounded um, by professional artists who are full-time artists. They were about 10 to 15 years older than me and they were really doing it and they already had full established practices. And I think being around them was like the best form of education I ever could have had. You know, this is how they priced their work. This is how they got commissions. This is how they sold their work. Um, And that was really valuable. I think that uh, to be honest, I think, you know, it's, it is a very much a privilege to go to art school. I was very lucky. I got a, um, a big fellowship. I would say that if you want to go to art school, go to Cooper Union. It's in New York City. Um, It's completely free. It's one of the best schools in the country. Um, If you want to go to art school, I would say go to there. But, you know, the life of an artist is so hard. You have to be willing to die for your work. It's, you know, it's really intense. You have to really, really love what you're doing. Um, So... No, I, I, I would, I would say if you want to go to art school, go to Cooper Union. But huh. um, not many free uh, schools out there yeah. <laughs> to, to choose from, probably. But that sounds yeah. great. And then you don't have that student loan burden to deal with after you graduate. Yeah, I, I think that the really the best thing for um, an emerging artist to do is that you need to develop a um, a comprehensive body of work, which can be really hard. Right, you have to figure out what are you interested in, what do you want to do. Develop your body of work. If you need to learn techniques, learn techniques. But also just, you know, uh, go to workshops, go do artist residencies. Um, You will meet other people who will 
uh, who will help you so much. And you'll meet uh, curators, cultural organizers, individuals who will support your practice. Because what you need as an artist is you need a village of people who believe in you. Mm. So you it know, sounds like a, that tribe yeah. and community is really important. You know, just yeah. finding, finding your people. Yeah, you know, yeah. you need you need someone who, um, and they don't have to be in the art world, but you need a, you need a group of people um, who really believe in what you do and will will can will fight for what you do alongside you. Nice. Uh, one more practical question: You live in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. Where are the the hubs in America that are most conducive to finding your community and your tribe, and also succeeding in the art world? Well, you know, I mean, I, I lived in um, I lived in New York uh, before I came to D.C. And I was actually, um, you know, immediately after I graduated from from university, I was like, all of my friends were working as art professors and they were making no money. So I was like, I can't work in the arts. It's going to be a disaster. Um, so I started working as a sailor in New York, um, which I really loved. What's and, that? Uh, I, was, I was working for a sailing company. So I was sailing. Sa Oh, actual sailing. I thought, yeah, I thought you meant like yeah. sales or something. No. Like you were in sales. <laughs> no, no. So I was, um, I mean, basically what I would do is I would work as a full-time sailor in New York during the summertime. And then I would, I would uh, do artist residencies the rest of the year. And, um, and then because this fellowship in DC, I was able to transition to being a full-time artist all year round. But um, I thought, you know, I thought, oh, I should go to New York. That's what you do as an artist. But it was a horrible idea because it's so <laughs> oversaturated with artists, right? Yeah. There's, there's, you know, an artist like every square foot or something. And, um, you know, I, I think that as an artist, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, you need to be surrounded by a couple of people who also can support your creative vision. But it's not good to be in a place where there's, uh, you know, there's more artists than there is like dogs or something, you know? Um, and, and, and New York's also very difficult because it's a particular type of artist. You know, I, I don't make sexy male art. I don't 3D print like beer cans. My work is a little bit different. And I think that I also truly believe that for every single artist, there is a city that makes the amount of, that makes perfect sense, you mm -hmm. know? It's going to be unique to them. Yeah, and I I yeah. think that, you know, maybe there's a different artist who's not me, and New York is perfect. They want to make sexy male art, and they want to 3D print beer cans, and that's fine. And I think that um, I think that for me, you know, what's unique about D.C. is that there's more lawyers, politicians, um, activists that come through my studio than, quote-unquote, art people. But that's mm -hmm. super conducive to my practice, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, a big part of my practice is that I work with the D.C. Department of Forensic Science. So um, a lot of the, the guns that I melt down come through there after they've um, gone through forensic evidence, which takes a couple of years. And that's a huge part of my work. And I don't that would definitely not be possible in New York City or maybe any other place because there's such a valuable connection in between culture, art and politics in the city um, and that just happens to be the sort of right niche for me. Wow. And um, the other thing I would say, too, is that uh, it's very important that you live in a place that values art. So one of the things that's very unique about D.C. is that they have grants for artists, um, which are fellowship programs, public art grants, and uh, it's really, really well funded. So in New York City, if you, you can apply to like an NEA grant, which I think is like $7,000, but you only get to get it like once in your lifetime. And in D.C., there's so many grants which are available for, um, you know, not just quote-unquote artists, but musicians, cultural producers, mm -hmm. and they're available on a yearly basis, and that makes a huge difference as a creative. Oh, that's great information. Uh, yeah. Mercedes, it's been so fun and informative to talk to you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Yeah. Can you tell us where people can find you online and social media? Yeah, so um, my website is stephaniemercedes.com, and Mercedes is spelled just like the car. And um, and then my Instagram is uh, Mercedes underscore the artist. Awesome. Are you pretty yeah. active on Instagram? I actually, um, before, uh, before the pandemic, I was not active on Instagram. And then the quarantine started. My girlfriend was like, okay, you have no choice. You have to start an Instagram. So <laughs> since COVID hit, I have been very active on Instagram and yeah. um, I'm better for it. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm really 
pleased to talk to someone with such a unique niche in this industry. And um, I encourage all of my listeners to, to go online, look at your work, and um, do that history, um, you know, do your homework on the Argentinian dirty war. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And if you go, actually, if you go to my website too, there's one section which is uh, called Excavating Histories. And there's a bunch of also YouTube videos which go into the, the history of the dictatorship in, in conjunction with my work. Awesome. Mercedes, thanks for being oh, on the show. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favorite ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.